Hola, buenos días. ¿Qué digo de ti? Para mí es un placer y un honor muy especial eh, presentar a alguien que he querido y admirado prácticamente toda mi vida. Hoy le recordaba como en el año 74 un estudiante de 19 años de esta escuela lo visitaba y él se pasaba una mañana conmigo enseñándome en su instituto en la quinta avenida lo que estaba haciendo. Con los años he terminado hasta haciendo una exposición para contar una de las obras más importantes de la arquitectura que se está haciendo en este país, la Ciudad de la Cultura eh, de Galicia, y eh, le hice la maldad de no hacer una exposición, sino hacer un centro de interpretación. Esto es poder contar y explicar cómo cada línea, cada elemento que Peter traza tiene un soporte teórico y tiene una razón estructural eh, de hacer. Al mismo tiempo, Peter Eisman no es solamente uno de los arquitectos más importantes de su generación. Si decimos media docena de arquitectos en el mundo, siempre tenemos que decir Peter Eisman, sino es el gran teórico y el que toda su vida ha seguido creyendo en el valor de esa teoría de la arquitectura y cómo esa teoría de la arquitectura modifica a nuestra sociedad. Hoy viene como amigo y viene en el marco del programa que Luis Fernández Galeano muy generosamente nos ha organizado siempre en esta escuela. Hemos tenido a Jagersot, hemos tenido a Renzo Piano, hemos tenido a todo el mundo. Así que le paso los trastos a Luis para que haga la presentación real. La mía es mucho más sentimental y mucho más de homenaje. Peter, bienvenido siempre a esta escuela y eso sí, espero que tengamos un acto muy especial cuando de una, iba a decir puñetera vez, se termine de cerrar los edificios que faltan de la Ciudad de la Cultura de Galicia y vengas a contar el proyecto ya entero y completo y fotografiado. Bienvenidos a todos y bienvenido a Peter Eisman. They want me to say something. Please. No, but I won't, I, I won't be long, and, and, and I will be careful. Be careful. Uh, <laughs> no, no. I'm very fragile. You know. Oh, I know, I know. We Fragility is something that comes the, to all of us. The champions, so you have to be very careful. Oh, you lost because you were supporting the wrong team, no. you know? <laughs> but the, my, my players scored two for your team, so... Well, of course. <laughs> Well, he's a Welshman. He's not an Englishman. He's Do remember Welshman. that. Yes, a Welshman. Yeah, no, I'm not an Englishman. No, no. Peter is not an Englishman either. Although he was, uh, <laughs> he, he spent part of his uh, uh, years of, of training in, in, in Cambridge University, where he took his PhD. But I'm not going to discuss Peter today. I think uh, only to say that he has been very generous not to discuss his work full stop, but to discuss some theoretical questions of contemporary architecture by that being the problems of digital architecture. This is, I think, a, a, a significant and I would say a very topical uh, thing that uh, worries all of us, students and teachers in this school. And so I, I, I'm very uh, grateful for you to, um, you know, to hold the torch of thinking in a school which is not only dealing with uh, making. Um, only to, to finish up, this is the fourth and last lecture in this series in which we have had, uh, as, as, as the director remember, uh, Norman Foster, uh, Jack Herzog, Ren Sopiano, and now Peter Eisman. Some of them also took some time correcting the students and uh, commenting on the work. And uh, I'm very grateful to the four of them. And today, very especially to Peter, who will discuss uh, architecture and the digital. <laughs> OK. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. OK. Um, thank you, Manolo, and thank you, Luis, and thank you all for coming. I understand school is not in session, uh, and so this is sort of uh, after the fact. Um, I couldn't come to Madrid 
without coming to the university. I always uh, have a chance to come here. It's always a very uh, receptive audience, and uh, I'm really pleased uh, to be able to talk. In fact, the talk that I'm giving uh, is a, I'm trying it out uh, on, on you, so it'll be the first time I'm going to read uh, the theoretical part of the talk, and then I'm going to show images from a project that we are exhibiting at the Venice Biennale now. It just opened uh, two days ago. <clears throat> so there'll be two parts to the lecture. One, uh, a philosophical part or theoretical part, and then uh, see a project that is under construction. talked about uh, Norman Foster, Jacques Herzog, Renzo Piano, and myself, are not only separated by the three are star architects, and I fall into some other category, but I would like to say in introducing what I want to talk about tonight, that there are two genealogies that uh, really uh, underpin the, any discussion of architecture. Those two genealogies begin with abstraction on the one hand and phenomena on the other. And therefore, I think it's impossible to talk about modern, postmodern, classical, neoclassical, digital, etc. I think the two categories are phenomena and um, abstraction. And I want to say that my difference but from Norman Foster and Jacques Herzog and Renzo Piano, three architects that I admire very much, are really uh, genealogically phenomena. And uh, however you want to put it, uh, I cannot escape um, abstraction. Uh, fortunately uh, for us, uh, Rem Koolhaas, among others, is uh, we um, ally ally with um, abstraction. So uh, I'm going to um, give you a talk which discusses the state of uh, abstraction and phenomena uh, today uh, in relationship to uh, the digital. Uh, and I think that's the um, key issue that I want to talk about. Uh, I'm going to read from this text because I it's the only way to get it correct. In Mario Carpo's latest book, The Second Digital Turn, the, uh, it's the second part of a three-volume work, he argues that the making of architecture in the digital era has entered a new phase. While the beginning of the digital age was characterized by spline-based algorithms, and some of you should probably know what a spline-based algorithm is, I don't. Uh, but um, it's um, a hot term, that spline-based algorithms generated architectural and spatial continuity. For example, see the work of Zaha Hadid. The second digital turn is characterized by something other than splines and continuity, and that are voxels, which are tiny units of data, fragments not of holes but of parts in themselves, suggesting a shift away from continuity and toward discontinuity. The idea of continuity as an animating idea in architecture can be traced back to 1485, when in his famous 10-book treatise, Leone Battista Alberti proposed one of the most lasting caveats in architectural thought. While supposedly a subtle Greek critique of Vitruvius, 15 centuries earlier, Alberti's dictum of part to whole, which is relevant today, of a house as a small city and a city as a large house, has survived to this day underlying the thesis of continuity in architecture. Now, the history of architecture is punctuated by alternating periods 
of absorption and resistance to power, that is, by periods of both continuity and discontinuity. Modernism was one of those periods where both continuity and discontinuity, uh, absorption and resistance, were active. On one hand, modernism was, in essence, a rejection of the status quo, breaking with the idea of social and political continuity. It forms were iconic of this break with history and complexity in form served the notion of discontinuity. So when you had this idea of complexity, it proposed a discontinuity. Yet even though the ideology of the newly minted fascist and Soviet uh, regimes were a symbol of clarity of their political orders, modern architecture served them. That is the axis of power beginning in 1922 in Italy and continuing in Russia in 33, as well as in the Nazi Germany of the same period. Therefore, modern modernism, which was initially a form of resistance to power, later became useful as a form of power itself. The opposition between continuity and discontinuity, or between complexity and simplicity, says something about the relationship of architecture to power. <clears throat> in this light, the argument presented in the second digital turn, lacking a certain consciousness, lays out a problem that is becoming increasingly important in contemporary architecture. If one wants to argue that technological changes of the second digital turn facilitate the production of complex and heterogeneous forms, then all manners of complexity are now as easily produced as all manners of simplicity. And that's something that uh, really uh, one has to understand, that the voxel notion, as opposed to supply notion, now produces complexity, uh, which was a term that stood against, as it were, power. In other words, when discontinuity and complexity acquire the capacity to operate as an orthodoxy, orthodoxy then no resistance can be ascribed to any form of complexity, <coughs> since any, the idea of complexity would be of equal value to simplicity. This is a conundrum that is produced in the second digital age. Uh, otherwise, architecture uh, will lose the capacity to be resistant. And, and this is an important idea. The second digital turn, characterized by a visual excess of data, often supposes producing an idea of discomforter. Comforter. In this sense, the second digital term, uh, turn might also have a direction. For example, in the theory of merology, which is a theory of parts, that is, parts becoming free-floating, neither signified nor signifier, <coughs> approximating the status in digital terms of a voxel. It is possible, then, that the project of voxels, torn from a part to whole context and existing not as things, but as gaps, as absences between things, could suggest a new project for architecture. However, the problem remains, which has to do with the relationship between these processes that produce architecture and the way architecture is read. In this case, the new voxel-based digital software complexity, as I've said, becomes as easy to produce as simplicity, which means that the form only appears to be complex. In other words, the case of production, the ease of production negates the idea of complexity itself, changing how the architecture must be read and negating its resistance to power. In other words, complexity, the difficulty of reading architecture was something that was resistant to power. And it was something that architects used as a resistance to being consumed by the status quo, 
consumed by whatever power, whether it's economic, social, or political power, the idea of resistance was the possibility of an architecture through complexity to resist uh, easy reading. The architectural critic Jeff Kipnis wrote in an, an essay in a book by, called By Other Means, architecture can only assist the empowered to exercise insidious control over the suborned if the latter, that is those people, the, the population, are not paying close attention to the architecture itself. Whenever a work of architecture com demands close attention, close reading, its palette of effects cannot but change in character from the emotive to the intellectual, and it can no longer serve so easily the ends of power. So what Kipnis is arguing is that if the architecture demands close reading, it resists consumption by whatever power uh, is in place. When this uh, change is produced, arch architecture operates critically as a challenge to power. However, if the, today's digital algorithms can effortlessly produce complexity, fragmentation, or the like, that is something that demands close reading that was formerly resistant, then the idea of close reading is no longer a power of resistance. Uh, for a close reading of these forms will ultimately only uh, uncover its algorithm. That is, complexity ultimately reveals simplicity. In this sense, the digital cannot be resistant to power, for the complexity resides only in the surface as a result of math mathematical operations increasingly facilitated by um, computational power. And so the argument is, if and it were a complexity, that is the difficulty of absorption of, com of understanding <coughs> was what architecture had as resistant to power. And when that complexity today is as easily produced as any other form, then it no longer is resistant. And therefore, the means that architecture had to withstand the power of politics, economics, social power, the, the ability to stand against has been reduced. And this is a difficult situation. It's a place where we all, practicing architects, critics, teachers, students, find themselves. Because once the, the power that archa had, architecture had as a resistant force uh, is no longer present, uh, then what is architecture for? And I think this is a uh, question that I propose tonight. The, this book by Carpo, therefore, recognizes and celebrates the ability of the digital to generate complexity and fragmentation as easy as continuity. But this ease is precisely what prevents complexity from continuing to be a mode of resistance. Now that's part one of what I wanted to say. Part two has to deal with the project, the part three, that I'm going to show um, after this brief introduction. And uh, our, uh, sort of articulates the same uh, particular idea. For the past 50 years, since 1968, the architectural debate has been between two obvious poles, modernism and postmodernism. While these terms had real weight in 1968, the year of the student revolutions in Paris and the United States, they could define whether a building was modern or alternatively postmodern. Today, when looking back at buildings of that time, one is no longer certain that these terms have any validity. For example, in 1968, would have been possible to say with certainty that Le Corbusier's building at Harvard, the Carpenter Center, was modern. Today, that same statement seems problematic, as does any attempt to categorize 
today's architectural production as modern or postmodern. To say something that is, is also post-postmodern merely shows the emptiness of these categories. The building that I'm going to show today, the housing project for the Piazza Erba in Milano, demonstrates a potential new topology, not only for our work, but for new construction in general. It proposes the intersection of the two genealogies that I was talking about at the top, abstraction and phenomena. And it will be argued in this building that they have always constituted the underlying structure of any critical dialogue. In other words, the, uh, you don't have a building without phenomena, that is physical presence, materiality, uh, light, air, space, color, etc. But you don't have an idea in that phenomena uh, without a, what I would call the other. And the other is that which is not included in phenomena, that is abstraction. And the notion in modernism was that the possibility um, of a Hegelian synthesis was possible. That is, between the abstraction, the other, and the phenomena, there could be brought together is a kind of union, a synthetic union. This proved to be uh, not really possible. Modernism never succeeded in uh, architecture the way it did, let's say, in painting, in literature, uh, in music, um, precisely because the other was absorbed into phenomena. And so what we're saying in this project and that we're experimenting with is the possibility of not a synthesis of the abstract remaining other, the phenomena remaining in its way, and uh, not uh, attempting a synthesis at all. Abstraction in these terms refers to any aspect of architecture which is embedded in what I would call a syntactic structure, that is, in an indexical relationship uh, to the present, that is something outside of experience, outside of physical presence, uh, an idea which generates what is known, uh, has been known as criticality. While these two uh, phenomena is grounded, other, and in the other hand, in the material presence and will always be there of the architectural object. That's why we like architectural drawing, because in architectural drawing, we can draw uh, phenomena, we can draw abstraction, uh, we don't have to worry about their reality. Once they become real building, the notion of phenomena overwhelms, as it were, abstraction and, and um, makes abstraction other. We're assuming that otherness, uh, which is a term from modern uh, uh, structural, post-structural philosophy, the notion of the otherness in the work that we're showing. Abstraction uh, and uh, phenomena, therefore, are two issues two genealogies that represent disparate modes of thought that have shaped architectural discourse for the past half century. They intersect in our work. In other words, we've always been assumed to be abstract architects. Uh, in Santiago, we moved away somewhat from abstraction toward phenomena, um, and um, this project is also another movement away towards the possibility of both uh, simultaneously. Um, the two genealogies represent uh, the disparate modes of thought. Uh, they intersect in this uh, project I'm going to show you, and we'll see how that operates. The building becomes a superposition of different constraints internal functional requirements fused with a tripartite Milanese housing typology. 
the urban contextual discourses are overlaid with rendering of three different I was wondering, I'm thinking, I'm hearing a noise. It's uh, phenomena. It's real noise. Real noise. Uh, they're not done. I mean, that's just set up as an idea of the other. Thank you. Th um, thank you all for sort of, uh, I know this isn't the way it usually works here, but that's the problem with the digital, remember. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, this is, doesn't move. Oh, the control is there? Oh, I have to go there. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. No, 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 no. I want to do it myself. <laughs> no, no. I want to be in touch with phenomena. Okay? So, therefore, I want to touch it. Okay? All right. Um, yeah, we turn the lights down a little bit. That's a good idea. Uh, you can turn these down too if you want. Um, this is a. Um, um, oh, no. Marta. Marta. <laughs> See, don't don't work. <laughs> what did you do? Okay. 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 Thank you. Okay. Okay. Right. Martha, stay here. Maybe you want to do it here. No, but then I can't. Okay. This is the um, uh, building under. This is uh, the what it's going to be like. This is the context. It's um, to the east of the Piazza del Duomo. In Milano, it's near the uh, School of, of Architecture um, and um, sort of in a very nice uh, neighborhood. We were chosen to do this project um, uh, against Vittorio Grigotti. Uh, we both made presentations. They chose our presentation, the, the sort of consortium uh, that wanted to do this. The constraints that we had on this site were, which you have to start with, um, they wanted 75 units uh, for uh, condominium, uh, so that was a, a requirement. They couldn't do this with 72 or, or 68. They needed 75. Number two, uh, since we were on the flight path, path between uh, Western flights coming into the city airport, Linate, we could only have a 34 meter height uh, was a requirement for the project, number two. Um, and uh, there were certain modifications that we had to maintain the street line. Uh, there was an existing building on the site that we couldn't touch. Uh, and these things go into what is real project, and uh, these were the constraints that we started with. Uh, I've got to remember to go here. Uh, that's back. Down. Down. Oh. There you go. There's the um, figure ground uh, site plan. Uh, here is our building. Um, you can see there's a large parkland uh, in or a garden area in the block and we wanted to continue that as you can see uh, in some way in our proposal. Um, no. Okay, so we started with a perimeter block uh, as the only way we could get the 75 
units and the height restriction. The problem with the perimeter block is that we couldn't build over the exist, there was an existing structure here that we couldn't build over, so we lost some area uh, of the block. Uh, then we had to shorten uh, the backside because we were too close in terms of zoning regulations. This is all to do with non-architectural things that were limiting to what needed to go into building a building. Um, so we couldn't, uh, in fact, build closer uh, to this front block uh, with the back block like this. So not only did we have to shorten it, but we had to reduce its size to allow for both uh, these two arrows to work in terms of what would be uh, allowed. Oh, uh, uh, I got to restore. Okay. Um, the next was that we had to uh, move the uh, this block back from the sidewalk because of this height of the building across the street. We also had to take off the corner. Uh, as you can see here, uh, so that we've got this very strange uh, relationship of the uh, what was formerly a perimeter block. Um, uh, it's very delicate. Um, we then decided that uh, it would be better if we, in fact, um, did a single block uh, that we wouldn't have to, to dis disrupt uh, the whole idea of continuity. So we made the first attempt at an individual block like this. And then we found that we could do much better if we made a curve. I've never done a curved building before. It's not something that I wanted to do, but we found that it seemed to work in terms of the organization of the units and the uh, vertical circulation better as a continuous curve. Um, we then located, we wanted to have in the project uh, a uh, front-to-back orientation of all of the units and so uh, in other words that there would be two exposures for light on each unit and there were no corridors so the the idea was to produce uh, six vertical shafts uh, with openings to each side of the horizontal so there were no horizontal uh, corridors um, Um, I'm going to make sure the thing jumps. Okay. Maybe you should try and do it because I, yeah, I'll, I'll tell you when. We got to go back, go back. <laughs> it's not what's here. Yes. Keep going. Back. Yeah. Okay. Whoa. Okay. So what we ended up with was a uh, a rhythm vertically uh, that was A A B A A B etc. That you can see on the left drawing. And in the right drawing, the black indicates the stair towers and the gray, uh, the social units, uh, the uh, apartment units. Next. Okay. Um, we then wanted to have uh, a tripartite organization in terms of the M Milan uh, building typology, which was base, middle, and height. Uh, that all, most of the residential units in Milan did this, so we took the um, project on the, the form on the left. You can see it was a base, 
a piano nobile, and uh, an upper story. <coughs> Tripartite organization. Next. The model that we used, which is a famous model, uh, something if you go to Milan it's worth going to see, is uh, Giovanni Muzio's uh, Ca Bruta, uh, Brutal House, which I think is uh, an interesting uh, name for this. And you can see in terms of the stonework and, and facade orientation, a tripartite uh, scheme, the lower uh, lighter colored stone, the middle uh, piano nobile, a uh, darker colored stone, and then a, a, a very different uh, <coughs> superstructure. <coughs> Excuse me. The interior corner was uh, one that interested us, uh, the way it was articulated by Muzio, and then you see the plan uh, of the left hand part of the project, which is very similar to the plan that we were working with, this triangular plan. Um, and again, one of the important things in Muzio's project is that it's got a smooth surface. If you look at the external surface, it's quite smooth, and the interior is quite mottled. And so there was always a in, in difference between inside and outside, and also back and front, which was a a, a classical idea that Muzio brought into uh, contemporary building in 1921, which is something that animated what we were trying to do. Next. And uh, so there on the left is the, uh, the lower story. On the right, the diagram punctured by uh, openings, punctured into a solid were uh, Roman travertine as a base of the project. Next. And then the middle story uh, we, uh, is on the left. And then the upper story uh, was, again, a different rhythm than the AAB. We wanted this disjunction between the base and the, and the top upper part. And so you see a, a quite different reading and we wanted a, um, an idea that the upper story could be what we would call urban villas. There were two and three story units. Uh, because of the front back orientation, we were able to bring things like, in a sense, townhouses um, in the air. Next, please. Mm. It's OK. And here you can see the base, the piano nobile, and the, the villas on top, uh, how they would be in a straight line, and then how they become articulated in the curve. Next. And then the, the, what we get on the right, on the left, is a, a grid, which uh, an, an abstract grid, uh, which uh, frames these villas into a structure of front and back. And that grid uh, allows the volumes within it to push forward and back, uh, allowing for, on the facade, as you will see, a, a different orientation, a different reading of the relationship of front and back, uh, the front side uh, being more articulate with the grid and the backside being more articula articulated with the volumes. Can't see it in these drawings, but uh, supposedly we can do so in the next. Um, and you missed the base plans. OK. The roof plan and the ground floor plan, uh, you can see. Uh, the relationship to the site and to the uh, vertical cores, uh, which are articulated. I'm not going to point because uh, I don't have it. You can see the vertical cores. Next. And the uh, plans, uh, intermediate levels, they're very simple, uh, straightforward, uh, articulated. Um, Project. What you can notice 
is that the volume is pushed forward from the back, allowing a, a, the, the frames to articulate, right? Yeah. Uh, but uh, something that becomes architectural. And you can see that the shape of the building doesn't necessarily conform in each floor uh, to the volumetric unit, so that the building shape and the volume occupied are two different uh, objects that uh, become, in a sense, in a kind of tension to one another. Next. It's, a, it's okay. It doesn't want to go. That's all right. We can miss it. It's a section. <laughs> you don't need to worry about it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so section, very straightforward. Next. <laughs> now, I'm not sure that's next, but <laughs> keep going. <laughs> that's all right. Yeah, you understand what I was faced with. Okay, that's cool. Next. <laughs> um, the elevations uh, of the project. Um, you, there's a whole different idea of rhythms uh, in terms of the bass and the relationship of the openings to the Piano Nobile, which is all glass and steel, and then the upper uh, urban villas, which are white Carrara marble. So there's the, the physical being and the uh, coloration and the, the texture of the project has this three-part organization, not only in the material, the wall material, but in the glazed material as well. Next. Here's a model that is just on display at the Venice Biennale now, <coughs> which uh, shows you the, the actual physical structure uh, and the differentiation in the different layers. Uh, next. Now, you, you got to try and keep it on for a minute. There you go. Again, pictures taken from the uh, Venice Biennale, which just opened a couple of days ago. Uh, next. Um, the studies for the lower enclosure along the street, this is something that the zoning ordinance uh, forced us to do uh, to make uh, sure that the perimeter block was obeyed. And so we had to make a one-story addition uh, to the project. We wanted the garden, as you saw in the early slide, to read flew through into our garden uh, but uh, the Planning Commission insisted on this vertical screen. Next. And again, you see it from the other corner. Next. It's okay. It doesn't matter where we're, I don't know where we are anyway. Next. Here's the, um, the backside. And again, the same thing accrued to the backside. We needed to make a framed enclosure closure to hold the street line. And you can see the, uh, that on the, uh, this drawing. Next, please. Uh, OK, next. There are several renderings. There's one which uh, shows the, the end, um, the, the triangular end over the uh, existing building, which is underneath. And you can see how strong the, the grid reads on the upper uh, level and how strong the, the stone work is on the lower level. Here's a, a, a rendering again showing the play of the two completely uh, disassociated in terms of their rhythm from one another. That is the bass, uh, while it's tripartite, 
doesn't relate in terms of its rhythms to the um, upper story. Um, so that there's no, what I would consider, synthesis between the lower part and the upper part. Next. Should be one more. Okay. Next. No, I think that's it. Okay, what I... Oh, no. Oh, no, we got construction. Forgot reality. Uh, it's actually being built. Um, and um, uh, I think being built well. Next. You can see, uh, I, I thought the construction company didn't want to build the frames because they said they said no uh, functional purpose for them. And it was very expensive, these uh, steel uh, trellises as you want. Uh, you can see them and, and they're, they're doing quite well. The joints are really nicely done. Um, so the fact that these things need to be built well is also important uh, in the project. Next, I think that's it. Okay, what I, I want to conclude by talking about this term of resistance. And I have a, a uh, socio-psychological interpretation of the idea of resistance. My feeling is, is that a lot of students uh, me, you, etc., have built in an apparatus which requires you to be resistant to your parents, to accepted modes of behavior. And that's what this notion of resistance, this socio psychological idea of resistance, inhabits a lot of architects. That's why in 68, <coughs> in Paris, the uh, leaders of the student revolt were architectural students, that the, uh, many of the leaders of the revolt in the United States in 68 uh, were architects. The symbolic, uh, outside of the burning of the ghetto, the symbolic building built, burnt in the sort of upper miller, middle class uh, realm of, of the United States was the burning of the architecture building in 1968 at Yale, the only uh, college building that was torched, and uh, it's very symbolic that it was architecture. So for me, the people that inhabit architecture are already resistant people. That is, you choose to be an architect not because you're talented, not because you want to make money, not because you want to fit into society in the way that people who study law, business, medicine, etc., are accepted in the world. That architectural students, architects, architectural teachers, philosophers are already uh, resistant to the mores of social uh, etiquette, let's say. Uh, when I told my parents I wanted to be an architect, and uh, uh, it's the first idea that I had in my life. I had been 18 years in the world. I never thought a thought, okay? I went to college. I was studying chemistry because my father was an organic chemist, and that was what sons did. They did what their fathers did. And uh, I can remember vividly the moment uh, when I said to my parents, I have an idea, uh, which was in the first, uh, in 18 years, and they all came and sat in the, the symbolic room where decisions were made in our house, and I said, I'm going to be an architect. And my father looked at me in a strange way and said, is this another one of your jokes? Uh, um, <laughs> And that's how people thought of architects. And it was clear that there was some form of resistance that I wasn't aware of, that they weren't aware of, that later in my psychoanalysis was revealed to me as part of who I was. I would like to think that I'm not in this room unusual. 
and that the possibility that architecture is a resistant mode of behavior is something that attracts many of us. It could be 10 of you in this room. It could be 20 of you. But it's something that doesn't want you to be a doctor, a lawyer, a businessman, or do what mommy and daddy told you to do. Uh, and therefore, to me, this idea of architecture as a mode of resistance to the accept, accepted forms of behavior, to architecture as being other, has always been important uh, in not only the people who are doing architecture, but the people who architecture is done for. And therefore, the idea that the digital will be able to reduce the possibility of architecture becoming resistant is a problematic that architecture has never faced before. And so what I am leaving you with is not a solution to your resistant behavior or your uh, otherness, but saying is that it's in, that there is a threat from the digital which is something that architecture has never had to deal with before. How one reacts to that is going to decide how one deals with uh, the future of the physical environment. Thank you very much. You must have some questions, uh, something. Yes, you have to do it in English because I'm, I'm resistant to Spanish. That's fine. <laughs> That's fine because I'm Irish. Um, but yeah, it was just a quick question because you said it was the first time reading this. So I don't know, from, from having read it for the first time, do you have any thoughts now off the top of your head of, of, of ideas that were strengthened just by saying them or things that you're saying, oh, maybe I should cut that out? Let me say that I would argue that, say, Santiago was the first time I used real materials as an idea uh, in the work. And the whole notion was to, to synthesize the abstraction with the real into a unitary idea. Um, and in other words, I was operating as a Hegelian, let's say, in the idea of the dialectical synthesis. We were brought up in, in at least American uh, Western society, at least in America, that the Hegelian synthesis was the way to deal with opposing conditions. And I realized that one of the things that I had never done even though I had done abstract work, I had never done real work, I would never done the opposition of these two, that is the clash of abstraction and reality. This is the first attempt that I've made at that uh, clash, let's say, the, non, the, the irresolution of the dialectic. Um, one of the leading American uh, historian critics said that I had showed this building to him and he said he thought it was my best project because of this notion of irresolution. I don't know. Uh, I present it in extremis in, in the sense that I really believe that architecture is threatened in the possibility of carrying out its purported resistance. And the non-resolution of the dialectic would be one way of being other, of being resistant to existing forms of behavior. Uh, I, I don't know if that answers your question, but. I, I, I think it does. Yes, hello. Um, you state that um, uh, uh, the dig that this second digital turn could decrease um, 
uh, resistance because it is somehow decreasing complexity? Right. Or at least how it, complexity is It produces is read. complexity as easily as it produces simplicity. Yeah. What I'm saying is what appears to be complex is just the same as simplicity now. And therefore complexity, which used to stand as resistance against ease of consumption, absorption, is no longer possible, is mm. no longer a tool for the architect. Yeah, but my question goes yeah. a bit farther than that. Meaning, uh, do you think there is any possibility of uh, collaboration between the digital and architects to increase that resistance, which is not as it used to be? I would argue, yes, that's what I, I would hope that that was the case. Um, it's a little late for me. Uh, <laughs> as, I mean, um, uh, I'm, I'm working on end game strategies now. I mean, I'm fascinated because once you reach a certain age, uh, you have to think about what are you going to do with the rest of the time? I don't want to just fade away and go fishing. I'm interested in, in disturbing as much as possible. Uh, and uh, otherwise he wouldn't be my friend. Uh, and so the, the, I'm trying to find the, the most provocative way of dealing with what I consider the consumption of the digital in social media and whatever. And um, for me, uh, this late game, the end game, is, is, is a fascinating one. You don't think about an end game, but when you get to be 85 and your friends are disappearing, uh, you say, hey, I, I got to have a game for this. And chess is a really interesting model because there, the end game is one of the most important parts of chess. And so um, I, I'm starting to think about end game strategies. Uh, and so I think the digital, how one deals with the digital is clearly one of them. And, uh, what I point out to Mario Carpo, who I think is a very brilliant historian theoretician, that the notion of voxel-based digital produces complexity so easily that the form of resistance usually used by architects, i.e. complexity, is no longer any more a resistant form. And so given that, I say, hey, what do we do as architects? And then it leads me to think that, well, maybe we shouldn't be involved in Alberti anymore. Uh, maybe we should resist it's the part to whole relationship that he talked about. Maybe we should no longer be Hegelians uh, in terms of the synthetic project uh, that should be no longer part of the synthetic project. And so laying out the boundaries for what possibly could be a way for these young people, not for me, the young people to say, uh, reach their aspirations through built form. Uh, this is one possible uh, way that I, I'm thinking about. Um, and um, I think the question, and Cynthia, my wife and I, have uh, been talking about this, the question of the other. And we can't lose uh, the notion of otherness. And when the digital consumes all into one happy synthesis, I get worried. Uh, it's my natural behavior. And so that uh, it's not up to me to solve this everything bubble. It's the audience here. I just wanted to present uh, the question of how do you deal, and you've asked it, can we deal positively with the digital? I, I introduced into this talk the idea of merology. Merology interests me because it's a question of parts. It's a, it's a, a, the, a theory of parts that are not related to wholes, but parts that are voids and fragments, not things that is phenomena. So it ties up both of my thinking. I don't know enough about merology, but I do know it's a hot subject, okay? And if these students haven't heard of it yet, they ought to go out and find out about it because 
uh, it comes out of voxel-based algorithms. Uh, and um, I don't know what a voxel-based algorithm is, but I'm certain all of these people do. Uh, and um, it's very different than a spline-based algorithm. It produces different uh, phenomena, let's say. And so I think that the computer will and the digital will always work toward uh, finding an overcoming of resistance, etc., while producing in itself another form of resistance. So yes, I think if I were three years old, I told an audience a few weeks ago in China, if I were three years old, I'd move to China uh, for sure uh, and start working on the third digital revolution. Uh, and I'm certain that's where it's going to happen. Anyway, another. Hello, my English not is very good, but I want to know uh, what is the project for you? Uh, more interesting, more uh, emotional. And the other question is when you thinking in a project, uh, you think in, in the global city, in the in, in plant, or how do you what, how do you think? No, I always. I mean, I'm old fashioned. I, I don't think, and you can have a, an idea without a plan. Uh, I mean, I don't think you can start with a three-dimensional, non-grounded uh, icon in a computer and start moving it around without a ground. The ground is a fundamental condition of architecture that exists in no other discipline. Not in painting, not in sculpture, sculpture a little bit, but not. Architecture cannot be without ground. And how we deal with the ground is where the possibility of resistance comes in. Um, and so for me, the ground is the plan. Uh, and to have space, you can't just have a plan, you have to have a section, and uh, a sec an animated section, let's say. And um, if you can't make a plan, you don't have an idea in space. And so, yes, for me, um, uh, I'm very old-fashioned. I think that you have to have a plan. And, um, yeah. Uh, no? What, there's one. There's one, one there. Yeah. Hello, uh, th uh, thank you for your... Uh, you have to talk up. Uh, yeah, yeah, sorry for my English. I, I, uh, we, we had a congress one month ago in this university about anthologies, and we analyzed Heiss anthology, Michael Heiss anthology, architecture theory since 1968, uh, from the critical perspective of Sylvia Levin, one of the cases, no? Mm -hmm. uh, 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 and and this, she says that anthologies uh, instrumentalize the past in order to support uh, a, a kind of uh, architectural practice to legitimize it. Uh, um, and uh, I would like to know what, you, what is your opinion about, uh, because uh, this kind of uh, theory that you defend uh, about uh, the theory as a way to produce a revolutionary architecture, and, and I think this is the great discontinuity with, with against the past, no? theory as a way to produce this revolutionary architecture is, as Lavin says, that is based in an inherited uh, myth from the Enlightenment, uh, more or less. And uh, of course, uh, I, I want to know you this uh, because Alberti, for example, is, is before, no? But do you think that, the question is, do you think that uh, this idea of theory uh, as a way to produce a revolutionary architecture is, uh, is really useful? Will what? This, this idea of theory, yes. uh, not as Vitruvius or Blondel, as a way right. to understand the practice. And the practice right. is before and the theory is after. But in your case, I think theory is before and practice is after as, as a kind of critical uh, uh, approach to reality. No? Do you think that this Levin's critic about uh, how ontologies instrumentalize the past is true? as a way to legitimize practice as your practice, for example? I, you're asking me about a, a, a 
way of looking at theory and practice and current phenomena, uh, if, if it will be productive or not, let's say. I have no answer to whether, I mean, I'm not suggesting, by the way, you use the term revolutionary. Uh, I don't believe resistant is revolutionary. I think it's much more subtle than that. Um, the project I showed you uh, is not revolutionary and it may not even be resistant, uh, but I would like to think it is. Uh, my, my feeling is if you don't know the discipline, that is if you don't know the history of, of, the, of the, the, the being, you cannot think in the present because if you're asked to think about something, it has to be referential to something that has been or exists, and it has to be a commentary on what either has been or exists. Uh, without that commentary, um, I think that one doesn't have architecture, period. So architecture is a commentary on, on being in the present, uh, understanding how that present is uh, informed by the past, and it will inform in the future. So for me, there can no be any architecture without some form of theory and uh, without some form of realization. I, I should close this by saying Manfredo Tofuri said something really important to me that I also want to pass on to these students. Manfredo said, Peter, no one will care about your ideas if you don't build. And I think that's absolutely true, that if the ideas are abstractions, etc., building our phenomena, you cannot have the abstraction without the phenomena because then the abstraction is not other. And that lesson from Tofuri to me is the whole reason why I'm here today. Thank you very much.